Murphy is a graduate of uh, Dartmouth College and uh, completed medical school at uh, Cornell and then did his uh, orthopedic training at the Harvard Combined Program, uh, followed by a uh, clinical fellowship with Hugh Chandler in arthroplasty and a uh, fellowship in hip preservation in, with Reinhold Gans and Maurice Mueller in Switzerland, along with an orthopedic biomechanic fellowship as well. Um, Dr. Murphy then uh, turned his attention to uh, computer-based uh, technology and hip, and hip surgery and computer navigation. He's a pioneer in the field of CT-based navigation. Uh, he actually holds 47 patents in uh, CT technology and uh, hip implant technology, along with uh, surgical uh, instrument design. Uh, as you may be aware, he is the inventor of the superior capsulotomy and the sextant, or hip expert, uh, as we now refer to it. Um, and now, more recently, Murph turns his attention to uh, bundle payments and uh, cost effectiveness in a, in a hip and knee surgery, uh, which is the focus of today's research. Um, he's the a co founder of uh, Ortho New England Group, which is an organization dedicated to uh, physician run orthopedic bundles. And uh, that's, uh, that's how we uh, got onto the topic of. Uh, the, the Medicare bundle payment system and cost savings in hip arthroplasty. And uh, this research, uh, I'm proud to say, uh, is uh, the uh, recipient of the uh, uh, um, Charlie Award, which will be presented at AOS uh, in the spring. So uh, we'll hear more about that now. Thanks, Bert. Carl, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. This is a little bit of a home game for us, obviously. and. Um, and uh, it's kind of funny for me to talk about economics because uh, I've really been sort of like a surgical technique, implant design, surgical technologist type of person. And this economic stuff has been a little bit of a happy accident, which I've found to be really enjoyable to get involved in. Um, <clears throat> these are my disclosures. So. Again, why healthcare economics? Because I'm not really an economist. I don't have an MBA, and I don't know much about money. Um, it it really started with the advent of the. It really started with the government. Uh, federal government announced the bundled care uh, payment initiative, and uh, that created a huge opportunity for physicians. And I started communicating with the people at Archway, who developed uh, great management management mechanisms for this, and things really grew from there. So I wanted to talk about uh, the bundle payment programs um, and national Medicare data that we uh, morphed into from that experience, and wanted to get early on into the Massachusetts situation, both with the government and private payers, how the Baptist uh, uh, sizes up compared to everybody else, how the doctors do. Um, and uh, the effect of surgical technique and technology on economics. <clears throat> and then, in addition, I want to review uh, the, the Charlie Award work, which is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, national review of bundle payment management, both on the hospital side and the surgeon side, how hospital volume affects quality and outcome, how surgeon volume affects quality and outcome, and then a little bit on private payment inequity in Massachusetts and perhaps what we might do about that. So getting into the government style stuff, there's event based and there's population based uh, health care reform. Population based would be ACOs trying to manage uh, lower cost and better outcome <clears throat> on a population basis. Um, you'll see in the literature that those programs have not been very effective <clears throat> and they really have not saved very much money. And the government figured that uh, the events were really expensive, and people were very close to the ground on this, and maybe they could save a lot more money on event-based uh, management. And that's where the BPCI program came from, and also more recently the CJR program. Turns out the voluntary BPCI program has been much better and much more effective. The involuntary CJR program has not so much. So in 2014, after starting BPCI, which is a, uh, the Innovation Institute uh, program from CMS, they decided to allow physicians to apply for and take responsibility for their own bundles, which was different before. At the beginning of the program, 
It was only hospitals that could initiate or other organizations that could initiate and take responsibility. Why did they do this? Well, there is some theory that the physicians know more about these patients and know more about what's necessary and may be more effective in uh, improving care, which actually turned out to be true. Um, and it was really this management stuff that led to looking at other data that allowed us to look at national information about what's going on in orthopedics. And that led to looking at the limited data set from CMS, which um, is a very interesting uh, data set. It's basically all the money that Medicare spends on Part A for all of medicine. It's a very large database, very complicated database. And our uh, group of collaborators at Archway, um, and uh, we took a look at this and started to figure some things out. Uh, so we started looking at hip replacement and knee replacement, and we have visibility into every single operation that has been done between 2013 and actually halfway through 2017 now. Um, and we can sort out where patients went, what happened to them, whether they were readmitted, whether they died, what the cost was. And this information is very powerful. It's about 100 times larger uh, an economic study than anything that's been done previously. And we have visibility into every surgeon and every hospital in the country except for Maryland. So we can look at spend by category, acute care, rehab, home health, readmission, outpatient. So this is how we use that data initially. What we did was we took the entire database, filtered it for DRG uh, 469 and 70, filtered out uh, 469, which is uh, more complex cases. Then we looked just at hip. Then we looked just at elective hip. Then you see down here in the lower right, we adjusted all the dollars to January 1st of 2013 so that the day of surgery uh, is flattened. And we also did geographic normalization based on other databases so that the entire country is equivalent in terms of cost. And then that is the analysis pool that we looked at. You can look at a lot of national things, which is really interesting. In this uh, slide, you can see length of stay is trending downward. Uh, SNF utilization is trending downward. Home health is trending downward. Percent of readmissions is trickling downward, as is mortality. And you can see that all of these add up uh, at, at a trend of lowering cost. But you can see that most of the trend toward lowering cost <laughs> is not hospital expense. It's uh, post-discharge, post-acute expense. In this case, primarily, you can see in the orange is SNF. You can see from the bottom up. Anchor inpatient, which is the blue, means the hospital. The next one up is a skilled nursing facility. The next one up is home health, and then readmits, outpatient, and then long-term care. And you'll see those, uh, those little legends on the side on several of these slides. So you can reinterpret this data in lots of different ways and look at interesting things. Just for fun, this is a geographic map that shows the length of stay nationally. Just say in New York, patients stay in the hospital a lot longer than ours do. Um, and you can see down in the south, there's a lot more inpatient utilization. 90-day readmission rate nationally. Massachusetts is doing pretty well. Um, other parts of the country are doing better. Again, uh, the central south has higher readmission rates than other parts of the country. Mortality, very similar. Um, for some reason, there's higher mortality in the south than there is up here. Uh, and there's some hot spots. And this is very, very large data. This is about you know, 400,000 cases. So these are not statistical aberrations. This is actually true. So I thought it'd be fun to look at, at us, because we all work here. A lot of us are trained here. Um, and there's a lot going on in Massachusetts itself, so I think that uh, this is a good place to start. What about Massachusetts? What about elective primary DRG 470 total hip replacement and Medicare patients? Well, you can see the Baptist is on the top there with about three times the higher volume of Medicare total hip replacement than any other institution. And you would think that higher volume would equal lower cost, and in fact it does. This hospital is the lowest cost hospital in Massachusetts over a 90-day period for elective primary total hip replacement and Medicare patients. And this is 
We're not way ahead, but we're ahead. But this is certainly a combination of uh, everything that everybody in this room does, whether it's surgery, anesthesia, the hospital, case management, physical therapy. Um, you know, there's a combination of the work here that has led to great improvements. If you look at the surgeons, because we also have visibility into surgeons, you can see that of the top 20 lowest cost surgeons in Massachusetts, 10 of them either work or worked in this hospital over this data period. Also very impressive. Because over the past 15 years or so, I've been really working hard on some uh, technology and technique issues, I looked at that as well. On the left is the superior hip approach. On the right is uh, surgical technology for precision alignment. I was very interested in seeing if this had an effect. And in fact, it does. Those patients that have that surgery technique combined with that technology have the lowest cost of any patients in the state and by quite a bit, as a matter of fact. It's $7,000 on average, and it's about $1,100 less than the next nearest. And all these categories are statistically significant, lower inpatient costs, lower rehab, lower home health, lower readmission. So this was a validation of a lot of hard work, and I just want to thank people in this room who have um, you know, been very tolerant and understanding and even supportive of this work over the years. So shifting to, uh, again, national viewpoint, this was work that was just done recently, which was the work that was awarded the Charlie Award for the Hip Society for this year. And really what it did was it looked at bundle payments managed by doctors, unmanaged or managed by hospitals. And again, you remember the filtering to get to a flattened United States with elected primary hip replacement in Medicare. So this was done by normalizing all of the dollars again to January of 2013. And uh, we also regressed all demographic information so that we could detect any change in patient population over that period of time. And we looked at 90-day costs, readmission, mortality, and we also looked at the cost trend of all the hips that were done in unmanaged bundles or unmanaged episodes so that we could subtract out the lowering cost in general and uh, so that we did not contribute that, attribute that to the management itself. So if you look here, we have three groups, hospital-initiated BPCI bundles, physician-initiated BPCI bundles, and hips that were not in any bundle. And if you look here, you can see a couple of things that on the left is uh, unmanaged bundle or unmanaged episodes, and you can see the blue is inpatient, orange is, um, is uh, SNF, the next one up is home health, uh, outpatient readmit, the top one is long-term care, which isn't very much. But you can see a couple of things. One is that the left-hand one is unmanaged. Next one over is hospitals before BPCI. Next one over is hospitals managing BPCI. Next one is doctors before they started in the bundle, and the next one is doctors after they started managing the bundle. And you can see a couple of things. The physician-initiated bundles were lower cost to begin with as a baseline, and they went down more significantly. And you can see this. Um, it's only 4.8%, which actually is not that impressive, but of course this is subtracting out about 5.1% in baseline reduction. So if you look at physician-initiated bundles, they saved 20% more money than the hospital-initiated bundles, and this is statistically significant. And again, I think uh, it's also significant because we're subtracting out the background trend, which is 5.1%. And so these are 8 or 9% savings over time against historical spends. If you look at that data again, you would think, oh, maybe the PGPs, the physicians, are filtering their patients more so we can look at these things. Uh, and I'll show you that in a second. But if you look at uh, readmission and death, there's no change 
um, both in the hospital initiated or the physician initiated over the country. You can look at age and comorbidity, and there's no change in age or in comorbidity in the physician initiated bundles. And that's important because it basically demonstrates that there's, there's no systemic pattern of doctors filtering out more complicated patients and just taking care of simpler patients. So the conclusion from this study is that um, the people that take care of the patients are better at managing bundles than are the institutions themselves. And this is why Medicare continues to allow us to do this. Looking at other issues, there's so much data here, you can look at lots of other stuff. Do higher volume surgeons have lower costs and better outcomes? Let's look at cost, readmission, uh, and mortality as a function of surgeon volume. Another thing we can look at is hospital volume. Does hospital volume lead to better outcomes? Well, if you look, we broke this into five groups, four relatively equal groups of volume, highest volume, 200 plus over a three and a half year period. Remember, this is just Medicare, so you can more or less triple the volume if you want to know what these surgeons are doing clinically. Um, but one thing you'll notice is that almost three quarters of hip replacements are done by relatively experienced high volume surgeons, and there has been this general sense often quoted that most hip replacements are done by inexperienced surgeons in the United States, and that's not true. Another thing you can look at is cost as a function, not just volume. But look at this cost. We have very significant decrease in cost between every category depending on volume. And the two highest volume surgeon groups are almost 20% less costly than the three lowest volume surgeon groups. So it's uh, quite dramatic. And these are all statistically significant differences between volume groups of uh, surgeons. Um, and this conclusion, that was unnormalized data, but the conclusion holds true if you normalize the data uh, economically across the country. Where does this lower cost come from? You can see again, the bottom blue is inpatient, orange is SNF, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see that uh, the reduced use of skilled nurse, the higher the volume, the less likely the patient's going to go to rehab. The higher the volume, the less likely the patient's going to come back for readmission. This plot shows all the surgeons we have in the database in the entire United States that did a minimum of 30 cases. And you can see a very, very clear pattern that low volume surgeons are quite expensive. The expense is on the right and the volume is on the left, or the expense is on the bottom. And you can see that as, uh, as surgeon volume goes up, cost goes down. Um, but it's not a tight, tight correlation. And also readmission goes down with higher volume, so more experience, lower readmission. And this is quite statistically significant between every category yet again. Mortality. Mortality is amazing for hip. We looked at knee. It's not as dramatic as it is for the hip, but high volume equals less likelihood you're going to die. And uh, low volume is 10 times more likely over a 90-day period a patient's going to die after elective hip surgery. No one's ever noticed that before or published about that before, so I find that to be incredibly interesting information, especially if you're a patient. Um, but, you know, so you say, okay, well, what a lot of people did, you know, these big health care organizations, they go, if you do low volume, you can't do the surgery anymore. You don't need to do that. We have, we have granular level data on everybody, so you don't have to make policies. All you have to do is look at the information. So the great thing about it is it actually decreases the need for hospital policy because you can just look at information. What about hospitals? This was a really interesting thing to look at. This is national. This is a volume of Medicare hip replacement in the United States. Interesting just to look at this slide for a second just by itself. You can see that uh, special surgery is by far the highest volume. I did not realize that we are the second highest volume hospital for Medicare hip replacement in the United States. It's pretty impressive. I always thought we were four or five or something. And then you can see the rest of them. Some of these I'm not even familiar with. You know, the Hogue Orthopedic Institute didn't even exist 20 years ago, I don't think. 
uh, in California, but there's an amazing, amazing differentiation in volume here. These are the top 20. Does volume, remember, this institution is the highest volume in Massachusetts, also the lowest cost. Would you think that that would apply throughout the rest of the country, too? You might, but it doesn't. HSS is the highest volume, and they're incredibly high cost. And so when they do more cases, they don't get better. Um, very high SNF utilization, home health utilization, and outpatient utilization. So, you know, when you look at it, these institutions have great reputations, but if you look at the data and you see what's going on, you know who's good and who's not, and there's no more hiding. So, um, if you're looking at healthcare reform, I think that this institution would be a better one to look at than that one. What about readmission and mortality? You can look at all of these things, and some of these places are pretty high volume, and uh, they may have almost twice the uh, readmission rate of another hospital. And you can look at the complexity of the patient uh, population to make sure there aren't a lot of differences, but there aren't. So this is really, really, really amazing and interesting to me, um, and hopefully to you. So what about our local bundle payment experience? This is really what started this all off. Dave Terry runs Archway Health Advisors. He got a great group of people together. We started communicating a few years ago, and this is what led to all of this discussion. So we formed a group called Ortho New England Group to uh, apply to the government and receive permission to be an awardee convener in the bundle payment program. And then we engaged groups around New England, particularly in Massachusetts, to see what their data showed and then see what opportunities there were. And then we got a bunch of people together and we started managing bundles in April of 2015. And the nice thing about Medicare as opposed to the private insurance is Medicare contracts directly with doctors. They don't do hospital networks. Their payments are lower overall, but there is equal pay for equal work with Medicare on a relative basis, uh, unlike the um, contracting networks. So this is a very attractive feature of the government. And uh, this is our experience. So we started in April of 2015. We've managed 1,250 total joint replacements so far. And look what's happened here. We have a baseline period, and we have uh, two performance years. And compared to the historical costs, we've saved 20% over that time period, which adds up to $6.5 million. That money doesn't all come to us. A very significant amount of that just stays with the government. It was money that was never spent. Um, but they also directly save money in addition to that, and they distribute money to uh, these organizations that then pay management and distribute uh, to the stakeholders. But the amazing things about this, this is $5,100 a case over the baseline. And we're talking about operations that are, are only, you know, $20,000 to begin with. And then if you think that half of the expenditure is fixed because it's a hospital payment, this is really 40% reduction in post-discharge spend which is really dramatic. And you can see it's much, much more than the national average, which was about 5%. Things that drove these decrease, 77% decrease in SNF utilization. Um, and at the same time, you think, oh, gee, the patient's going home. They might have trouble. Well, the readmission rate went down 50%, so that's definitely not true. Outpatient cost 58%. Part B, this part I find interesting. Part B is basically doctors, 30% less. I, don't, I don't, didn't even know where that came from, but it's really probably rehab doctors that we don't have seeing the patients anymore is where that savings comes from. Really significant. So, and the other interesting thing is that the hospital payment is relatively fixed. There's not much you can do about that. So all these savings are not directly related to savings at the hospital. They're related to... Uh, post-discharge savings, really. You can look at a lot of different things. You can look at the average cost of skilled nursing facilities, average cost of home health care. 
if your patient goes to such and such an organization, what happens to them? We can look at that now. Really interesting to know. This is not our experience. This is the statewide experience for Massachusetts from the LDS. You can see here that there's a very wide variation in length of stay at these hospitals. As you know, if you talk to patients, they show up at the, at the rehab, and the rehab people tell them when their discharge date is before they evaluate them, right? And they hold them until they decide they're going to let them go. Sometimes the patients feel like they're imprisoned. Um, but if you, if, you, if you look at this Berkshire place, I don't, know, I don't know where that is. I don't know anybody there. I don't mean to pick on them particularly, but I did the math on this. If you go there, there's a 6% chance you're going to celebrate your birthday at the rehab. <laughs> <laughs> you can see home health. Now, this is, this is, um, this is total cost, so you know, the, the differences aren't that much. You can't see on the green. These are home health agencies, but you know the one on top. It's uh, it's more than two thousand. It's a couple thousand, fifteen hundred dollars less than the one on the bottom, and that's on, you know, uh, home health spend is say four thousand dollars. You say fifteen hundred dollars on four thousand dollars. It's a lot. So you can see, you can look at these home care agencies and see who's really efficient and who really isn't, who just keeps coming back. You know, sometimes the patient is out out and about in their car and they have to come back and meet the home care person because uh, they're waiting for them at home and of course they don't even qualify for home care but they keep coming. This is the kind of stuff that happens. So I think when you look at how did we, how did we save 20 percent over that period of time, it's really, really simple. There's, first of all, you have really smart people helping you. The other things we have is organized preoperative patient engagement because you're the person taking care of the patient, right? <clears throat> so you engage right away. You identify modifiable uh, obstacles to going home, family-related issues. Um, you put the surgeon at upside and downside risk. Downside risk is a very big motivator. No one's lost money because of the downside risk, I would say. We have no formal protocols. If you think you can do it better, go ahead and do it, you're at risk anyway, right? With everybody else, but you're at risk. So, and the other thing that's key is that there, we rarely have face-to-face -face formal meetings. I think the last one was a year and a half ago. All this stuff is done by phone call or by telephone, by email. Not a lot of meetings here. You don't need a lot of meetings. And a general increased focus on improved surgical technique. Um, and thinking about your patients, I think, even more intensely than you ever did before. Now, if you wonder why doctors do pretty well at this, if you look at it, there are a lot of conflicts for the hospital networks in this, in this space. And, um, you know, when you give lectures, you have to disclose, doctors have to disclose conflicts all the time. I've never really heard of a hospital network disclosing conflicts, but they have them much more than doctors do, but if you think no matter who's running it for the hospital, the nicest hospital administrator person, caring, wants to do the best thing, but, but if you look, we're trained in this specialty. We, we invented these operations, we designed these implants, we designed the minimally invasive operations, <coughs> we, uh, we designed the technologies to help us, and we're trained in the field, and we know the patient. So our engagement with a patient is career long. If a hospital runs these things, usually the person in charge never even meets the patient. And if someone in the hospital does meet the patient, these are now 24-hour experiences versus 24 years a lot of times for the doctor. That's a big difference. <coughs> We're trained in the specialty. If we improve the efficiency of hospital utilization, we don't have a conflict. But every dollar that the hospital doesn't get, uh, in, uh, every dollar we save is a, a dollar the hospital doesn't get. So there's a huge conflict there. Skilled nursing, a lot of these big organizations own their own SNFs. Every dollar they don't spend on the SNF is a dollar they don't get. Same with home health. Same with readmission. They capture the readmission and all those expenses too. So there are conflicts at every corner for the hospital systems and essentially not for the doctors, except if they own an outpatient physical therapy facility. 
So, again, um, why do we have better motivations in the hospitals if they own their own rehabs, if they own their own home care? A lot of these um, uh, hospital-based things are over-engineered, too many committee meetings, too many people talking about stuff that doesn't matter. Um, that's where they all get throttled. And the doctors are obviously the most highly trained stakeholder and know each patient personally and really and at personal risk and that really leads to great things. So if you look at it, these hospital systems, you talk about health care reform, what do you call an organization that's optimally designed over a period of decades to maximally increase revenue and to hinder every effort <laughs> at true health care reform with all these conflicts? And the answer is a large health care network, perfectly designed to prevent improvement in health care. So let's look here. This is Massachusetts private pay. This is new information, too. Just saw this this week. I was pretty excited about it. So the Massachusetts All-Payer Database, the group at Archway did amazing work on this very, very complicated database. Is there equality in payment for hip replacement in Massachusetts on the private side? Not really. You can see here, as you know, this hospital is the best at this operation in the state. We get 50% less than all these other hospitals that do way less volume, and their quality of work is way lower. There is absolutely no fairness there. And um, obviously, this hospital should get paid more for these operations, not less, because the post-discharge spend is way less, right? So you would think that we would get paid more, but we don't. So um, this is, it's clear that these negotiations are based on clout and coercion, and they have nothing to do with quality and merit, which is a little bit sad, but at least we can identify it and try and address this issue. So the question is, do we get better at coercion and, uh, and clout, or do we actually um, work toward equality of payment or payment for quality, which I think is better? So these organizations, the, these big healthcare networks that, that can negotiate with private insurers, right, they're not leading healthcare reform, they're leading the need for health care reform, clearly. So this is my favorite, you know. I trained at all these hospitals, very proud of that training. And uh, anyone I know who winds up training there, I'm really happy they go there, but on an economic basis, really. So I, I have to drive by this new administration building on Route 93 North every day twice. <laughs> So there's a lot of symbolism here. Can't ignore it. This morning I was driving in, looked at it again. I'm like, yeah, there's more to this, you know. So there's three arches there. The first one I think is unearned control over the entire patient population of Massachusetts. <laughs> the second one I see is unearned control over all the doctors in the network, the ones that went to medical school. And the third one is the unearned control, or not unearned, earned control over politicians, attorneys, both at a state and federal level. So these are, this is profoundly problematic, and good for them that they're great at this, but, but health care reform is not going to be led in this building. So for me, driving, I, I see this, and you put it all together, and every day I drive by twice, that's what I see, the S. <laughs> so, and you talk about network, everybody talks about network hardening, right? So, network hardening. What it is to me, everybody says, oh, you know, it's coordinated care, it's going to be better, it's going to be lower cost. It's actually not better at all, and it's much higher cost. So, you have this false mantra of higher quality, lower cost, which does not happen. And so this is what really needs to be dealt with. And network hardening, really, it's a form of protectionism because you need to harden your network because if you can't compete on a meritorious basis in the environment, the only way that you can make all that money is to corral all the patients into these fences. 
And the only way to make it meritorious is to break that down. And you'll notice with all these acquisitions, you would think that increasing networks, increasing coordination, lower cost, but every time a hospital comes into the fold, the cost goes up, not down. So anyway, I'm, I mean, I'm not telling you what to do about it or what we should do about it, but I think equality for, uh, or payment for quality work and for outcome makes sense, and, and using coercion is really not the solution. So the topics here, why healthcare economics, I got in this accidentally, um, but it's really been fun. The hospital compares really well in the state and nationally. The surgeons compare really well. This is a testament to everybody in this room and what you all do. Um, I'm really happy that surgical technique and surgical technology are, are statistically measurable as better things. From a national viewpoint, clearly uh, physicians who are at a, excuse me, ground level do very, very well uh, with managing care. Surgeon volume is directly correlated with better outcome and lower cost. Hospital volume, albeit this hospital, is correlated with lower cost and better outcome. Nationally, that's not true. And uh, we've had great experience with uh, bundle payment management over the past couple of years, and we're looking forward to continuing to do that. And I just, uh, you know, it's a little bit fun pointing out the incredible payment inequities in the private system here in Massachusetts, and hopefully that will change for the better. Thanks very much.